You're listening to the Fresh Hell Podcast. Fresh Hell contains stories of a disturbing and often graphic nature and is intended for a mature audience. Please don't let your kids listen to this or they might turn out like us. Hi, you're listening to the Fresh Hell Podcast. Thanks for joining us. I'm Annie. And I'm Johanna. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of our international true crime podcast. So Annie, you returned from Aruba. How was your trip? It was amazing. We had the best time. We splurged and we rented a cabana one day and I've never done that before. I have to say it was worth every penny. It was just incredibly relaxing and private. And my sister and I, we have the same birthday, uh, May 10th. And so we spent our entire birthday on boats, which for us is living the dream. (sighs) We went snorkeling in the morning and uh, we did a sunset cruise that night. It was really great. It was wonderful. And then we came home to more rain. But yeah, we really, really loved Loved Aruba, the people, the scenery, the pestechi. I'm probably still pronouncing it wrong, but they make these little fried pastries with gouda cheese in them. And how can you not love a country that makes pastry filled with gouda? You, you can't. It's the best. Of course, you taking a trip to Aruba can only mean one thing for today's episode. Yeah, that's right. Today, we're going to talk about the disappearance of Natalie Holloway. And we're going to call this one a mystery because we can't really say for sure that she's dead, although it doesn't look good. Natalie Ann Holloway was born on October 21st, 1986 in Clinton, Mississippi. Her parents are David and Beth Holloway, and they divorced in 1993 when Natalie was around seven years old. And Natalie and her younger brother were raised by their mom. In the year 2000, Beth Holloway remarried, and she married a wealthy Alabama businessman named George Twitty. His nickname was Jug, and I don't actually want to know why. Um, (laughs) So when Beth remarries, Natalie moves with her family to Mountain Brook, Alabama, which is a very expensive suburb of Birmingham. Natalie was a member of the National Honor Society and a big part of her school's dance squad. On May 24th, 2005, Natalie graduated high school with honors, and she was planning to attend the University of Alabama on a full academic scholarship. She was planning to study pre-med there. And only two days later, on Thursday, May 26, 2005, Natalie Holloway and over 100 fellow grads of Mountain Brook High arrived in Aruba for a five-day unofficial graduation trip. And they have an all-inclusive package at the resort on an island where the legal drinking age is 18. This doesn't sound like a great idea for students that are not used to have easy access to alcohol. Did I ever tell you that in Austria the legal drinking age for beer and wine is actually 16? But yeah, that's a whole different story, I guess. I know it is. It's similar. The UK is very similar to that. In any case, the group stayed at the Holiday Inn. We actually did a sailing trip that had us walk through the Holiday Inn lobby to the beach there. And it's nice, like nicer than what you would imagine when you think Holiday Inn. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with the Holiday Inn, but this place is a resort. It's right on the beach. And I actually took a few photos that I can show you so you'll see what I mean. But it was lovely. So her dad, Dave, he was not very happy about this trip. But her mom, Beth, she had no issues letting her daughter go on the trip. Apparently, it was a tradition at Mountain Brook High School. And her stepson, Jug's son, George, he'd gone a couple of years before. Also, the kids were accompanied by, I think it was seven chaperones. They met with the students every day to check in with them. But the chaperones were not supposed to keep up with their every move. And that's perfectly reasonable. In Austria, it is tradition for kids at 18 after their graduation to go on a one or two week binge drinking trip to Spain or Greece and super insane. There is a whole industry around it here. It's only the kids, no chaperones on these trips. And I didn't go back when I was graduating, but the rest of my class, they did. Mm, If my school did a trip like that, I wasn't invited. I don't think we did anything like that. Here you generally have to find a summer job or three because your student loans are going to be more expensive than a mortgage payment when you graduate. But it does sound like it was a really fun trip for most of the grads. Maybe too fun. So according to police commissioner Gerald Dompig, I think that's how you pronounce his name. He's the man who initially led the investigation until 2006. 
1996, and he said that the behavior of the Mountain Brook students was pretty out of hand. He said that, quote, there was wild partying, a lot of drinking, lots of room switching every night. We know the Holiday Inn told them that they weren't welcome next year. <laughs> Natalie, we know, she drank all day, every day, end quote. And there are a lot of reports like this, that Natalie in particular was there to party. And I just want to be clear that I'm not judging her. We're not judging her. That time, right after high school, is intoxicating in itself. You're an adult in so many ways, legally speaking, but you're still so much less mature than you think you are in hindsight. They're in Aruba, they're enjoying the warm turquoise water, the friendly people, the white sand beaches, the pastries filled with Gouda cheese, <laughs> the warm windy weather, the free-flowing booze, they're having fun. Fun. They're partying at a popular bar in Orangestad called Carlos and Charlie's. And it's May 30th, the last night of their trip. And I think when this episode comes out, it will be the anniversary is tomorrow, I think. There is uh, Carlos and Charles in Cancun. I think I mentioned I used to live and work in Cancun. And I didn't work in Carlos and Charles, but I worked in another huge club called Coco Bongo. <laughs> <laughs> and it was insane. I've never seen something like this and I've seen a lot of things. And most of our customers, they were US teenagers that were not allowed to drink back at home. And now they had access to a lot of free flowing alcohol at the open bars. So combine that thing. You can imagine all those things I've seen. And and I know Carlos and Charles, and I know it's pretty much the same. Yeah, exactly. After it was Carlos and Charlie's, it became a Senior Frogs for a while, but I think that's closed down now too. So it's at this bar that she runs into a new friend, 17-year-old Euron Vandersloot. And I read in a few places that she'd met him a couple of days earlier when she was playing blackjack at a casino. And that's the part about all of this that just makes me really sad because it does seem like she had met and spent time with him before this night. And Joran was a Dutch honor student. He was living in Aruba with his parents and attending the International School of Aruba. And he's with his two friends, the Calpo brothers. So 21-year-old Deepak, who owned the car, and his younger brother Satish, who was 18 at the time. When Natalie is last seen by her classmates leaving the nightclub, it's around 1.30 in the morning on Monday, May 30th. And she probably didn't think that she was with total strangers. And even if she did... And if she'd only met them that night, he's another kid. He's a 17-year-old who lives locally, and I'm sure she felt perfectly safe. I read reports that friends heard her say, woohoo, as she drove off with the boys. And unfortunately, that's the last time she was seen by her friends. It is extremely sad because we all did things like this when we were young. At least I know I did plenty of stupid things all the time when I was young. And now that I'm all grown up, looking back at my youth, honestly, I'm quite amazed that I'm still alive. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, Natalie drove off with the guys, just a bunch of young people having fun. Exactly. Exactly. And I know what you mean. My friends and I joke all the time about how amazed we are that we survived college. I certainly danced on my fair share of tables when I was young and healthy. No regrets. <laughs> No regrets. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So later that day, when she didn't appear in the lobby to meet up for her return flight, her friends went to her room looking for her. Obviously, they were thinking she's hung over and she overslept. And they found her packed luggage and her passport, but no sign of Natalie. They immediately notified the police and her parents that she was missing. When her mother got the call from one of the chaperones around 11 a.m. saying Natalie was missing, she called 911. The FBI and she and her husband and some friends immediately arranged for a private jet to take them to Aruba that same afternoon. And I think that's, that's awesome that you have the resources to do that. Because I know. I so she said that Natalie is never late and she immediately knew something was wrong. The Aruban authorities initiated searches for Natalie all over the island and in the surrounding waters, but they didn't find her. Meanwhile, within four hours of landing on the island, the Twitties, and that's Natalie's mom, Beth, and her husband, Jug, told the Aruban police the name and address of Euron Vandersloot, saying he's the guy Natalie was last seen with. Beth said that Vandersloot's full name was given to her by the night manager at the Holiday Inn, who recognized him on videotapes. The Twitties and their friends go to the Vandersloot house with two Aruban policemen to see if Natalie's there. And this 
seems a little bit strange to me, but I can also 100% see my mom doing this if I went missing. She would break down your door. We also recently had a case here in Boston where a young woman was kidnapped when she was leaving a bar, and she ended up being held at this scumbag's apartment and for a while. But fortunately, they found her alive. And so I'm sure that Natalie's family were hoping that a similar situation had happened and that they were going to find her there. But that was not the case. They talked to Joran van der Sloot, and his first story was that he initially completely denied knowing Natalie. But then he told a story which was corroborated by Deepak Kalpo, who was also at the house when they all arrived. Johanna, you want to tell them story too? This is probably the most well-known excuse he gave. Van der Sloot said that they drove Holloway to the California lighthouse area of Arashi Beach because she wanted to see sharks in the middle of the night. And then they dropped Natalie off at her hotel around 2 a.m. and that's it. He said Natalie fell down as she got out of the car but refused his help and as they were driving away she was tumbling towards the lobby when she was approached by a man in a black shirt similar to those worn by security guards. And that's the last time they saw her and she was fine and they just drove off. Annie, you went to the beach, right? What, what do you think about that? A couple of things. So I have to admit that after we did the New Jersey shark attack uh, episode research, sharks were a lot more on my mind than they usually are when I'm swimming in the ocean. Understandably. Um, mm -hmm. The island of Aruba, though, the waters around Aruba aren't really known for sharks. I don't even think there's been fatality. I'm knocking on wood just to, I don't like to say that out loud, but I don't think there's been a fatality uh, in the waters around Aruba with a shark attack. It's really not a thing. That said, Aruba has very rough seas on one side of the island, and I heard that they feed sharks on that side of the island, kind of near the lighthouse, and the theory was that it kept the sharks on that side of the island and away from the places where people like to swim. But I'm sure that that story is really more of like a jokey folk tale or superstition, because obviously that's not how sharks work. <laughs> you, know, you, know, you can't throw them food on one side of the island and they'll just never swim anywhere else. But if I had to guess, I'd say Yoran told her that you could see sharks at night because of this myth, and she believed him. Arashi is actually a really beautiful beach, and I wouldn't have any worries about uh, sharks while swimming there. Okay, and this is now just my personal experience. If you drive to a beach in the middle of the night, it's usually for two things. It's for skinny dipping and or doing drugs. Yes, I love night swimming. So... <laughs> I thought you were going to say I love drugs. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't hate them, but I love night swimming. I love the song Night Swimming by R.E.M. I love night swimming. Yeah, so practically speaking, the drive from Oranjestad to up to Arashi Beach would take you about 20 minutes. And then it's probably another 10 minutes or so to get to the Holiday Inn from Arashi Beach. If he really had dropped her off at her hotel at 2 a.m., then they really wouldn't have done anything but drive around and drop her off. And then, of course, there's no camera footage showing them dropping her off at the Holiday Inn. That said, there were ways to go back to your room without going through the lobby, so it didn't necessarily mean anything except that Yorin was lying about where they had dropped her off. So now there's this massive search. The Dutch Marines were searching the shoreline. Hundreds of volunteers from Aruba and the United States were searching. And the Aruban government gave thousands of civil servants the day off to participate in this search. Aruban banks raised $20,000 to aid in the volunteer efforts. And there are images of these buses that are usually filled with tourists for organized sightseeing tours. And they were absolutely packed with volunteers being taken to different areas of the island to search for her. So on the 4th of June 2005, the police pinpoints three Aruban men as the lead suspects. And these are, of course, Joran van der Sloot and the Kelpo brothers. And the next day, so on 5th of June, Aruban police detain Mickey John and Abraham Jones. They are former security guards from a nearby hotel. And I think they're brought in on a suspicion of murder and kidnapping but both are released on June 13th without being charged. I think they were probably taken into custody because of what Joran and Deepak had said about Natalie being approached by security guards. And it seems like these two were somehow on the police radar already, and they were known to try and pick up women from hotels in the area. So these two guys, they were held for eight days without any charges, and 
I think that's rough. I think in Austria you can only be detained as a suspect for 24 hours without a charge, but I could be wrong. Yeah, I'm not exactly sure what it is here either. I think it's between 48 and 72, but that you'd have to have a lot of evidence, I think, for this for the 72. In Aruba, the law allows for investigators to make an arrest based on serious suspicion, even if there's no initial evidence. But in order to keep holding the suspect in custody, they have to keep showing evidence that supports that the arrest was fair. So that makes sense. On June 5th, 2005, tourists and locals gathered at the California Lighthouse to attend a prayer vigil for Natalie. The uh, lighthouse overlooks a popular dive site. It's one of the places where we went snorkeling. There's a shipwreck. One of the beaches that Holloway visited the night she was last seen, which is Arashi. So I've got a photo from the lighthouse that we'll post and you can see Arashi Beach in the distance. On June 9th, 2005, those security guards are still being held by police. Joran Vandersloot and Satish and Deepak Kalpo are arrested on suspicion of kidnapping and murder. They've been under surveillance for a while, pretty much since the beginning, and apparently they had phone taps and their emails were being read, but the police said that they arrested Euron and the Calpo brothers before they wanted to, before they really had the evidence they were hoping to get, because of pressure put on them by Natalie's family and the media. On 11th of June, a spokesman for the Ruben Minister of Justice was interviewed and he basically said that Holloway was dead and that authorities knew the location of her body, which was not true, obviously. Mm -hmm. He later retracted the statement, saying he was a victim of a misinformation campaign. For me, it sounds like someone wanted just to be over and done with it. One week after the arrest of the three main suspects, another arrest was made, and that was uh, DJ Steve Kroos. He was taken in by the police, most likely because of info given by Joran and the Kalpo brothers, and he too was held for nine days. Yeah. And in the meantime, Joran kept coming up with different stories about where and when he had last seen Natalie. The next story, story three, is that he said they had gone to the Marriott Beach and the Calpo brothers dropped them off and that they fooled around or something. And then he left her there and went home. It's a half a mile walk for her back along the beach to her own hotel if that had happened. But I think this is also just total bullshit. Story four is that Euron was dropped off at home and the Calpo brothers took Natalie back to her hotel. And I think this is the moment where you can see that maybe the Calpo brothers and Euron van der Sloot are starting to turn on each other. On the 4th of July 2005, Deepak and Satish Calpo were released without charges. Euron is still being held, but Beth is very, very upset when the Calpo brothers are released. She makes a statement asking that no one, including the U.S. State Department, would allow the Calpo brothers to enter their countries if they should try to leave the island. She's completely distraught. She thinks some of the men who are responsible for her daughter's disappearance are getting ready to flee and get away with murder. And I get that. I mean, it's awful. She's quoted as saying, quote, Two suspects were released yesterday who were involved in a violent crime against my daughter. These criminals are not only being allowed to walk around among the tourists of Aruba, quote, but then also that they could go anywhere and hurt anyone, is what she's saying. And people aren't happy about that. It is understandable that she feels this way, but it also kind of backfires on her. And some citizens of Aruba protest, basically saying, well, if you don't like our laws, go home. Let's face it, it's a valid sentiment by the people of Aruba. So Beth makes another statement, apologizing if she offended any of the people of Aruba and clarifying that the rumor she asked the Aruban government to pay Texas EquiSearch is false. And for those of you who don't know what that is, I didn't, so I had to look it up. The Texas EquiSearch, short also TES, is a search and rescue organization that specializes in the search of missing persons and they are involved in a lot of famous cases. For example, of course, Natalie Holloway or Kaylee Anthony. During the search for Natalie, her family increased the reward for information leading to her safe return from $200,000 to $1 million. So Joran is going to be held for another 60 days. Also that day, the Royal Netherlands Air Force deployed three F-16 aircraft to aid in the search. So these jets were equipped with infrared sensors to help try to find differences, but the results came up empty. In March 2006, it was reported that satellite photos were being compared with photographs taken more recently, probably from those F-16s, in order to attempt to find any unexpected shifts of ground that might be Holloway's grave. But again, they found 
nothing. Then there's this business with the gardener and the jogger. First, the gardener. His name is Carlos, and he comes forward almost two months after Natalie went missing. And he claimed to have seen the Calpo brothers and Vandersloot, who attempted to hide his face as he drove into the racket club on the morning of May 30th, between 2.30 and 3 a.m. As a result of his story, a small pond near the Aruba Racket Club which is close to the Marriott Hotel Beach, uh, where Joran said he had left her. So they drained that small pond, and they found nothing. Another person, known as the Jogger, claimed to have seen men burying a blonde-haired woman in a landfill during the afternoon of May 30th. The police had already searched the landfill in the early days following Natalie's disappearance, but after the Jogger came forward and made this statement, the landfill was searched Three more times. The FBI brought in cadaver dogs to help, but nothing was ever found. And I did read somewhere that the jogger was never trustworthy as a source. It seems like he was as bad as anyone else in this story. But of course, they they had to look. Yeah, they had to, but to me, it sounds like someone wanted some attention. And I really hate those people because they take up a lot of investigative resources and a lot of time for people that could be used otherwise. So anyway, the FBI announced that the Aruban authorities had provided its agency with documents, suspect interviews, and other evidence. A park ranger found a piece of duct tape with strands of blonde hair attached to it on a beach. The samples were tested at a Dutch lab and were shown not to be Natalie's. A group from the Aruban police and prosecutor's office then traveled to the FBI's central laboratory in Quantico, Virginia. Their hair examples, they were tested a second time and the FBI actually they confirmed that the hair did not belong to Natalie. And that's super creepy, right? Duct tape with hair on it. I wonder <laughs> who that might have been. I know, I know. And there's a thought you're going to have again in this story, but I'm hoping it was just innocent. Like if I'm using duct tape, my hair is for sure going to end up. Do <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I just yeah, shed I know, like a dog. I know. I'm the same. <laughs> yeah. So I, when I first heard that, yeah, I had the same thought where it was like, oh no, there's someone else something else bad happened to someone else and we don't even know who it is. But then I thought, well, if I had these like duct tape to secure something and then pulled it off and it would for sure have a bunch of my hair on it. Well, so. if I would use duct tape, I, I'm so clumsy that it would end up in my hair actually. Yes, so I know. Yeah, you're right. It can be yeah. completely innocent. <laughs> and let's hope. Let's hope. I'm probably, you know, wishful thinking. Anyhow, on August 26, 2005, the Calpo brothers are rearrested and they're arrested along with a new suspect, 21 year old, Freddy, I think it's Arambatsis. What do you think? I think so too. I think yeah. that sounds about right. Okay. If not, we're sorry. Yeah, A R A M B A T Z I S. So Arambatsis lawyer said that his client was suspected of taking photographs of and having inappropriate physical contact with an underage girl. This incident allegedly occurred before the Holloway disappearance, but Arambatsi's friends, Vandersloot and the Calpo brothers, were apparently also involved in the incident. I heard that they were taking pictures of girls without their knowledge in bathing suits. But Vandersloot's mother, Anita Vandersloot, said, quote, it's a desperate attempt to get the boys to talk, but there is nothing to talk about, end quote. And it looks like maybe she was right, because later on, officials said that it was an unsuccessful attempt to get the brothers to confess. Back in the U.S., not many people were talking about Natalie anymore, of course, because Hurricane Katrina had just completely devastated New Orleans and the Gulf Coast of the U.S., and every news camera was focused on the suffering and loss of life there. I recently got hooked on the case of Sag and Eddie, and that one is heavily connected to Hurricane Katrina. I definitely want to do an episode about that one at one point. Do you know about the case? I don't know that much about it. That was kind of a crazy year for me, and I don't have a lot of memories of, of 2005. But yeah, I'm looking forward to hearing you cover it. We're going to look into it. So back to our case now. In the beginning of September 2005, Joran van der Sloot he was finally released, although he still remained a main suspect. And only a few days after Joran's release, all of the detained suspects were released without any charges. There are some thought by Natalie's family that this was done intentionally to avoid criticism while the press was busy with Katrina. 
I'm not sure there's any truth to that or how those things would really be connected in any way. I think they just couldn't hold people indefinitely without more evidence. What were they supposed to do? Anyway, later on, all restrictions on the remaining suspects were removed, but they technically remain suspects. So now they could go anywhere if they choose to. Yeah, that's right. So Joran's out, he's free, but he just can't keep his goddamn mouth shut. Honestly, in the months following the release, he gave several more interviews that explained his version of events. The most notable was broadcast on Fox News over three nights. During the interview, Vandersloot indicated that Natalie had wanted to have sex with him, but he did not want to have sex with her. Sure. Right? <laughs> he then stated that, <laughs> that Natalie wanted them to stay on the beach all night, but he had to go to school in the morning. So the responsible boy he was got picked up by his friend Satish around 3 a.m. and he left Holloway sitting on the beach. And he's he's definitely a real Prince Charming right there. Ugh, I know, right? I cannot imagine that anyone believes for even a second any of these guys. They're known for picking up girls. They have a reputation for allegedly maybe slipping things into the drinks of girls. So Joran insists that Satish had picked him up from the beach, but Satish Kalpo's attorney stated that his client had gone to sleep and had not returned to drive Van der Sloot home. It's funny because, <laughs> yeah, they, they yeah. turned on each other, definitely. Van der Sloot said that he was ashamed to have left a young woman alone on the beach even though that's what she wanted. <laughs> and he claimed that he was not truthful at first because he was convinced that Holloway would soon turn up, which seriously makes no sense at all. If you really have nothing to do with something, why would you ever lie? You you just wouldn't. I mean, wouldn't. especially in a case like this, you would tell them the truth because you don't want to get involved with it. Exactly. Especially when you look at how long they were held in prison for. If you were held in prison and you were not responsible and you had honestly not done anything, you just wouldn't lie this much. It, I mean, it's there's crazy. cases where people say they did something that they didn't later on. But the other way around, like you, you, you would say everything that you know just to be cleared of mm -hmm. anything. Yeah, I agree. Meanwhile, more people are interviewed by the Aruban authorities, more places are searched. The spokesperson for the Aruban Ministry of Justice, he gave an interview to CBS. And in that interview, he stated that he believed Natalie probably died from alcohol and or drug poisoning and was not murdered and that someone later hid her body. He also suggested that maybe her body had been moved several times to avoid being found. And he also stated that Aruba had spent about $3 million on on the investigation, which was about 40% of the entire police operational budget. He indicated there was evidence that pointed to possession, but not necessarily use, of illicit drugs by Natalie Holloway. Members of Holloway's family have obviously uh, denied that she used drugs. And I totally understand why Natalie's family says that and why they even would be 1000% convinced that Natalie would never use drugs. But we should also never underestimate how sometimes people change their mind about recreational drug use if they're put in a different, more relaxed environment, maybe like mm -hmm. you know, vacation on Aruba, blow off some steam. I mean, it happens. It does. Oh, sure. Absolutely. I just found it kind of annoying that they kept bringing it up. Like, I know they're trying to deflect criticism, but they never said what kind of evidence they had to support this. And I just, I don't know. I didn't like the spin was very victim blamey. Yeah, I just definitely. found it. Yeah, unnecessary. The authorities resumed the search for Natalie, but they requested help in their investigation by authorities in the Netherlands. So on April 16th, 2007, a combined Aruban and Dutch team begins to pursue the investigation in Aruba. Also in April of 2007, a book by Joran van der Sloot and reporter Zvezdana Bukoyevic. So they wrote a book, is it Dezak? Yeah. So, which means the case of Natalie Holloway. And it was published in Dutch. Uh, in the book, Joran van der Sloot gives his version of the night she disappeared. And he talks about the media frenzy that followed. And he admits and apologizes for his initial lies, but he maintains his innocence. I haven't read it. It was only published in Dutch. And I'm sure it's just a bunch of lies on paper. I'm 100% sure it's bullshit and it's not worth the time and money. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. 
don't. <laughs> Just don't. On April 27, a new search involving approximately 20 investigators was launched at um, the Wandersloot home in Aruba. The Dutch authorities searched the yard and the surrounding area. They were using shovels and thin metal roads to, you know, penetrate the dirt and the earth. Prosecution spokeswoman Van der Beetzen stated that according to Joran's father, Nothing suspicious was found, and all that was seized were diary entries of him and his wife and his personal computer, which was later on returned. One month later, the Kalpo family residence was subject to a similar search, and when the investigators arrived, the brothers did not want to let them in. So Depak and Satish were detained for about an hour, and they were released when the authorities left without taking anything from the home. I love how those two guys think they can resist a search warrant for their homes, honestly. Oh, yeah. These guys all think that the world just revolves around them, yeah. for sure. In November 2007, Yoron and the two brothers are rearrested on suspicion of manslaughter, but they're set free again in December. It seems like a constant back and forth in this case. And even though the investigations are closed due to a lack of evidence on the 18th of December 2007, that doesn't mean that the authorities stopped looking for evidence to prove that Yoron and the Calpo brothers were responsible. Meanwhile, George Jug Twitty filed divorce papers in Jefferson County Circuit Court on December 29, 2007. The court filing said in that the couple separated on December 15th and have, quote, such a complete incompatibility of temperament that the parties can no longer live together, end quote. Did you know that after the divorce, Beth was dating John Ramsey for a while? No, I didn't. Yeah, I have no idea how that happened. I guess they have some kind of my child died under mysterious circumstances, Tinder version or something like that. (laughs) I think they were dating for one or two years, something like that. It's weird, right? Well, I guess they must have felt like the only person who could understand what they were going through. I'm not surprised that Beth and Chuck, I love that name. (laughs) It's so weird. I'm not surprised that Beth and Chuck uh, were getting a divorce because unfortunately that's kind of a common theme whenever family members die or go missing. Honestly, I, I cannot even imagine how hard a situation like this must be on a family. Oh, I know. It's awful. And I mean, take this with a grain of salt, but I read in a few accounts that said that Jug was a really, really difficult man, that he was bombastic and just kind of rude and loud. And people who were initially very supportive of them eventually allegedly pulled away from him and Beth because of his behavior. And I do think that there is some truth uh, to the idea that the police would have been able to do their jobs better if Natalie's family hadn't been so aggressively involved. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying they shouldn't have been involved. And I completely understand why they behaved the way they did. I just think the extent they were involved, it it might have hindered the investigation. So he was a loud, rude, rich, super rich guy from Alabama. Uh Uh-huh. Did I ever tell you this? That that (laughs) Alabama was the only place where I was, well, my husband and I, we were yelled at. Like oh, really, really in a horror. And when we did our road trip and Alabama was our first stop, we were driving out from Atlanta, going through Alabama and on to, to Florida. And we had a rental car and it, uh, license plates from Louisiana. And we were driving from a Walmart parking lot, I think, because we were shopping something and we had the, we had a convertible and it was the, the top was down. And all of a sudden I hear a woman behind me yell, go back to Louisiana. And I'm like, <laughs> oh. I turn around. And she just stares at me like, what's going on? Why? Why are you being Oh, that's like so bizarre. That was so bizarre. Everybody else we met on this trip during those three weeks, were they were the nicest people. I love the South. I love them. Oh, but me too. Alabama yeah. was weird. Like, really Alabama weird. needs to get its shit together. And that's all <laughs> I'm going to say about that. <laughs> yeah, Alabama is lovely. Well, they have a great song. <laughs> They do. They do. And I know people, I know wonderful, wonderful people from Alabama. I'm just a little mad at Alabama right now. So that's all right. Back to the story. On 31st of January 2008, investigative journalist Peter De Vries, or Peter De Vries, said to the media that he knew what had happened in the case of Natalie Holloway. And he shared his findings with the police, stating that he would publicly show the newfound evidence in a special episode of his television program. On February 3rd, 2008, the undercover video aired on Dutch television showing Van der Sloot smoking, we assume it's marijuana, and admitting to being there during Holloway's death. 
how did the journalist obtain this highly, highly interesting video, you might ask? Well, Patrick van der Eem, working undercover for De Vries, had befriended van der Sloot, who was unaware that he was being videotaped when he said that Holloway had suffered some kind of seizure while having sex on the beach. After failing to revive her, he said that he summoned a friend named Dory, who loaded her on a boat and they dumped her body into the sea. Some of the quotes he used in the video were, quote, I tried to shake her, I was shaking that bitch, I was like, what is wrong with you, man? I almost wanted to cry. End quote. <laughs> like, oh no, I mean, <laughs> poor guy, he almost wanted to cry because now he had to go through the struggle of getting rid of Natalie. Van der Sloot also said he feels lucky the police were not able to recover Holloway's body. He said even more. He said, quote, I think I am incredibly lucky that she's never been found because if she had been found, I would be in deep shit. End quote. So this is, I think, the fifth version of this story, and it's the first time that his story includes him being there when Natalie died. If this is true, it supports the idea that he'd put something in her drink. Some reports indicate a belief that she'd been slipped a date rate drug, and that combined with alcohol, she died of an overdose. I think all three of these guys are just honestly terrible people. They repeatedly refer to Natalie as a bitch or a slut, and they're incredibly rude and dismissive about her as a person. A missing person. Mm -hmm. That they're suspects in her disappearance, and they're calling her a bitch and a slut. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. yeah it, it, it tells a lot about their characters, definitely. So much. So anyway, the prosecutor in Aruba decides that the video is admissible, but that the evidence wasn't enough to warrant another arrest. Although the taped confession appeared damning, Van der Sloot argued Argued that he was lying to impress Van der Eem, who he believed was a drug dealer. Ah, uh, yeah, of course, the old, how can I appear like a fucking piece of trash to impress another piece of trash stunt? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> seems, seems logical. That show was watched by 7 million viewers in the Netherlands, and it was the most popular non-sports program in Dutch television history. Van der Eem said that ABC paid $830,000 to secure the rights to broadcast the program in the United States. Yeah, I didn't see it. but I saw it. Did you? Yeah, not when they aired it live, but I saw it later on. Well, in March 2008, news reports came out that Van der Eem, I keep wanting to say Van der Sloot. Yeah, they're all the um, events. <laughs> they're all the, yeah. So news reports surfaced that Van der Eem was secretly taped after giving an interview for a Ruben television. Van der Eem, he thought that the cameras had been turned off. And so after the interview, he says that he'd been friends with Van der Sloot for years. And this contradicted his statement on De Vries' show that he had met van der Sloot in 2007. He also said that he expected to become a millionaire because yeah. of his involvement in the Holloway case and that he knew the person who supposedly disposed of Natalie's body and that van der Sloot had asked him for 2,000 euros to buy the man's silence. According to Dutch news service ANP, van der Eem, who had already signed a book deal, was, quote, furious, end quote, after learning the taping and he threatened the interviewer who sought legal advice. Now we have our second terrible book in the series, Van der Eem's <laughs> book. So he wrote this book, Overboard, and it was released in Dutch on June 25th of that year. Now, Van der Eem was arrested on December 13th in the Netherlands because he hit his girlfriend with a crowbar and then engaged in risky driving behavior when he was fleeing the police because he hit his girlfriend with a crowbar. And apparently every man involved in this thing is a dumpster fire in a skin suit. Mm, they all sound so lovely. Well, to be fair, what kind of people would ever be involved in a case like this? Terrible people. They're all terrible people. Mm. <laughs> in November 2008, Van der Sloot said in a one-hour-long interview to Fox News host Greta von Susteren that he had sold Natalie Holloway for $10,000 to a man he met in a casino as a sex slave. He stated that he was paid twice by the man, first when Holloway was taken and a second time later on to keep quiet. Van der Sloot also alleged that his father paid off two police officers who had found out that Holloway was taken to Venezuela, which is only 15 miles from Aruba. Fox even aired an audio recording provided by Joran, which he stated was a phone conversation between himself and his father. In this conversation, Joran's father displays knowledge of Joran's involvement in human trafficking. Well, and here comes the point. After the interview, Van der Sloot called Fox and he said he had been lying. What a surprise. <laughs> and apparently the second voice that could be heard in the recording was not really the voice of Paulus Van der Sloot, but Joran 
himself, and he was simply speaking in a lower tone. <laughs> His stories, they keep just getting more and more infuriating, and the worst part for me is to think that he made a lot of money from all this involvement in the case. I'm pretty sure he is... I don't know. I don't even want to say any terms that come to my mind. This He's, he's like, nope. I'm not going to stoop to the level of profanity, <laughs> although he would quite deserve it. Let's you just say, say it in like German. <laughs> I never swear in German. I only swear in English and Spanish. That's too funny. That's I never hilarious. swear in German. Yeah, I'm really not sure that tricking Fox News is any kind of an accomplishment that you should feel proud of. A lot of people here call them faux news. They're just the original fake news channel. It's, <laughs> they're so bad. So on February 1st, 2008, Groundhog Eve, Aruban prosecutors announced that they are reopening the case because of the tapes. A judge, however, refused to arrest Vandersloot, saying that there just isn't enough evidence. So now we're going to fast forward to 2010. In February, Paulus Van Vandersloot died of a heart attack while playing tennis because, you know, raising a sociopath takes a lot out of you. Isn't it nice, though? He died while doing something he loved. Ugh, I wish he was eaten by a shark. So. <laughs> uh, on March 29th, 2010, Vandersloot got in touch with Beth Twitty's lawyer. So he calls her lawyer and he says he's willing to tell the location of Natalie's body and finally tell the truth about how she died. All they have to do is pay him a quarter of a million dollars. But he'll take an advance of about 25 grand. Ah, classic Joran. I know. So, Beth notifies the FBI and they arrange to proceed with the transaction. They use an undercover officer in Aruba to deliver $10,000 to him. And then on May 10th, Vandersloot had $15,000 wire transferred to his account in the Netherlands. Surprise, surprise, the investigators determined that the information that he provided them in return was another lie because the house where he said Natalie's body would be found hadn't been built yet. And I doubt anybody was surprised that the lying liar lied again, right? <laughs> but upside, now they've got real charges that they can bring against him. Yeah, but that's not a big deal for our sunshine boy, Joran. He simply takes the 25000 and he heads first to Colombia and then on to Peru. It seems he had, among other serious character flaws, I think we can say that, a fairly serious gambling habit, and that money is burning a hole in his pocket. Now, here in Peru it is where the second part of the Marvelous Adventures of Joran van der Sloot takes place. Because if you think that the Natalie Holloway story was it, think again. It's here in Peru on May 30th that Joran meets Stephanie Flores Ramirez. Stephanie was born in Peru on July 22nd, 1988. She is the daughter of a retired race car driver, Ricardo Flores, and his wife, Maria Elena Ramirez. And she has four brothers. She was the only girl, loved to play soccer, and she was treated like a queen by her brothers. Her family, they seemed very close and they adored her. She was in her third year studying business administration at the University of Lima. She also ran the merchandising arm of the family's successful entertainment and event promotion business. And she was also putting her intelligence to good use, because she was a rather successful poker player. So... She registered to play in the Latin American poker tour that was happening in Lima right at that time. Yeah, and Stephanie was living with her dad, who was expecting her to arrive home later in the morning of the 30th after a Texas Hold'em tournament. When she didn't arrive home, he called one of her brothers, Enrique. And so Enrique heads to his parents' house, and they sit down and they call every friend of hers they can think to call, but no one has seen her. So they finally call the police, and they go to the casino to look for her, because it's really not like her to not show up. They find footage of her on the casino cameras, and at 3 a.m. you can see Flores on the security camera footage, and it shows her entering the casino alone and walking to a poker table, where she has the great misfortune to sit down next to Joran Vandersloot. And at first, when they see her, they're relieved, until they learn who it is that she was sitting with. In an interview with CNN, her brother said, quote, My wife typed Joran Vandersloot into Google and started screaming for me to see. I couldn't believe it. How could it be that guy? All I've been doing is reading about Natalie Holloway and what her family has gone through, quote, said Flores. Imagine the horror they must have felt when they learned all that happened. 
I can't. It, it's really, it's awful. Stephanie was a really trusting young woman. Her family said, quote, my sister is very friendly, always smiling, always nice to everyone, said Enrique Flores. So hotel videotape clearly shows the two of them entering a hotel room together on May 30th at 516 in the morning. And it seems like they were just hanging out and playing some video poker. At about 810 a.m., Vandersloot is seen walking across the street to a supermarket and returning with bread and two cups of coffee. Around 8.45 a.m., he is seen leaving the hotel alone with his bags, and he tells the hotel staff not to bother, quote, his girl. About an hour after Stephanie's family realized who she'd been with, they got a call from the police. Stephanie's bloody, lifeless body had been found by a maid who entered room 309, a room registered to Joran Vandersloot. She was killed five years to the day that Natalie disappeared. This is either the weirdest coincidence ever, or Joran likes to celebrate anniversaries in his own special Joran way. And of course Joran tried to outrun justice once more, but thank God, on 3rd of June 2010, he is finally arrested in Chile. So, hooray! In his written confession, released by Peruvian police, Vandersloot said that he briefly left the hotel to get some coffee and bread and returned to find Flores using his laptop computer without his permission. A police source says that she may have found information linking him to the disappearance of Holloway because that information was on his laptop when he was arrested. It seems like a fight began and she attempted to escape, so he killed her. Vandersloot stated, quote, I did not want to do it. The girl intruded into my private life. She didn't have any right. I went to her and I hit her. She was scared. We argued and she tried to escape. I grabbed her by the neck and hit her, end quote. Vandersloot says repeatedly that he was, quote, stoned on marijuana at the time. But this is probably a lie because apparently in Peru you get leniency if you commit a crime while on drugs. And we know he lies about literally everything. I know. I mean, he might have been, but high on marijuana if someone says i'm high on weed it's like okay <laughs> it's not the same as if someone's like i'm high on meth and that's more like okay <laughs> yeah, there's a difference you know so i don't like it stephanie was found fully clothed the autopsy found that she did not have sex before her death so she wasn't raped she did have some alcohol in her system but she wasn't drunk not drunk enough to not have fought him off when she was killed is sort of the way they said it. She suffered blunt force trauma to her head, which caused a brain hemorrhage, cranial fractures, and a broken neck. She also had a lot of serious injuries to her face and she showed signs of asphyxiation. The room was a bloody mess. Now, unlike the Natalie case, where some of the clothes Euron wore the night Natalie vanished were never found, Stephanie's blood was found on Euron's clothing when he was caught. So yeah, that really doesn't sound like, hey, I was high, I hit her once, and look what happened, I'm sorry, I really didn't mm -hmm. mean to, oopsie. This sounds like he went into full-on rage mode. Yeah, I agree. I think that from everything I've read, it really does seem like Joran was a complete sociopath with fairly lax parents. It seems like he just got whatever he wanted, and when things didn't go his way, he would snap. Yeah. Sounds like it, definitely. On 11th of January 2012, Van der Sloot pled guilty to the qualified murder and simple robbery of Flores. He was convicted and sentenced to 28 years imprisonment for the murder, and he must pay $75,000 to the Flores family. Hours after learning of the sentence, Van der Sloot was transferred to Pietras Gordas, maximum security prison. And you can Google photos of this prison. It really doesn't look like a lot of fun. I bet Aruba was way nicer. Oh, I can guarantee that. I wish I was back in Aruba right now. So, okay, now we need to talk about John Ludwig. John Ludwig was a friend of Euron who appeared on the Nancy Grace show and a bunch of other programs when Van der Sloot was arrested in Peru. He went on to defend his friend, and he said that the victim in Peru, Miss Flores, he said that she should have been more careful when she realized who Van der Sloot was. He said, quote, I'm not saying she deserved it, but she definitely could have prevented it by leaving immediately, end quote. Holy fuck, what's wrong with all those people? I mean, they're just all awful. 
And in the meantime, Dave Holloway, Natalie's dad, he's back in the States, and he filed a petition with the Alabama courts to have his daughter declared legally dead. The papers were served on Natalie's mother, Beth, and she announced that she was going to oppose the position. She did not want to declare her dead. But on January 12th, 2012, a second hearing was held, and as a result, the judge signed the order declaring Natalie Holloway to be legally dead. And in other big news, on the 4th of July, 2014, Jorn Vandersloot got married. He married a Peruvian woman named Lady Figueroa, who he met while she was visiting another family member in prison. And it seems in Peru, you can get a lot closer to people in prison visits because she was seven months pregnant with his baby at the time of the wedding, which happened, of course, in the prison. So, I mean, they are living the dream. On September 28th, 2014, Figueroa gave birth in Peru. I think she had a baby girl, but all I have to say about that is I sincerely wish that child well. Yes. In August 2014, uh, Vandersloot was transferred to Chayapaica prison in the south of Peru. And this place is apparently in the mountains. It's harsh weather, very isolated. Not a place where any of us would like to end up, to be quite honest. Mm -hmm. And maybe you do want to hear more good news. Joran van der Sloot has apparently been stepped not only once, but twice by fellow inmates, according to van der Sloot's lawyer. <laughs> Why has he been stepped? Well, it looks like prisoners believe that Chayapalka prison will be shut down if a high-profile murder is committed. Now, it's not like I ever wish someone to be stepped, but I have to say... It also doesn't give me sleepless nights that this happened to Joran. It couldn't have happened to a better guy. In 2017, the Oxygen Channel aired The Disappearance of Natalie Holloway. This was a serialized show where Natalie's father, Dave, and his private investigator, TJ Ward, they went back to Aruba chasing new leads in the case. Um, have you watched it? No, I haven't. No, I didn't watch it either. I did read several articles about the program, though. One of the characters that shows up on this program is that old asshole, John Ludwig the guy who said Stephanie had it coming. So he's on this other show as well. And he agreed to talk after an informant working with TJ recorded him saying that Joran had paid him $1,500 to dig up Natalie's body. He claimed he and Joran spent hours crushing her bones and then they doused her skull in gasoline and set it on fire in a cave. After the skull had been burned and all the bones crushed, Vandersloot added in some dog remains. And then they went to a crematorium where Ludwig said, he told the worker that he had lost a pet quote i went in there with 200 dollars cash and said this dog means a lot to me and freaking i don't want anyone to be the last one to touch it except me if i give you 200 dollars, can i push it in myself end quote and first of all that's nuts right like who it yeah yeah so ludwig goes on to say that he and vanderslope borrowed a fisherman's boat and took the ashes out to sea where they scattered her remains. Ludwig also said that van der Sloot's father, Paulus, had helped the son dispose of the body. And he'd also, you know, he'd been arrested and released as well. I mean, I have to say it was a clever way to dispose of a body if they really did it like this. I mean, we've seen people dispose of bodies where they were found immediately. This is like, they, they were really thorough with what they did. Absolutely. <laughs> They did find bone fragments in their search, and one was, in fact, human, but it did not belong to Natalie. I know, and I thought it was really funny at first about how people would find bone fragments on the beach, but once I went to Aruba, it didn't seem that strange to me anymore because there's a ton of coral on the beaches, and I could totally see how you might think it was a bone. I'll post a photo or two so you can see what I mean, but I'm I'm frankly kind of amazed they, they found bones. And again, like the duct tape, I really wonder whose bone did they find, because it was a human but we don't know who it was, just not mm. Natalie. And I read that Natalie's mother later on sued Oxygen because she felt it was all scripted and she had given her DNA to be tested for comparison when Dave told her they'd found something. But she was never told it was for a TV show. So before we end, we have one more death to cover. And believe me, that's a good one. So the informant who led the Oxygen documentary to Ludwig was Emily. Emily had kind of a relationship with Ludwig and we read varying reports that either it was a romantic relationship and it ended or he wanted it to be romantic but it never was, whatever. It seems they were roommates at one time and he told her all about Joran and what they claim to have done to Natalie's remains. And that's what freaked her out, she said, and that's the reason she stopped 
seeing him. So later on, this is now Tuesday, March 13th, 2018, she arrives home, and as she's getting out of the car, Ludwig, dressed all in black, wearing a black ski mask, rushes her and forces her back into the car, and he puts a knife to her throat. She starts screaming, so he shoves a gag into her mouth. They struggle, and she manages to get the knife away from him. She kind of cuts herself a little bit in the process. But then she's trying to get out the passenger door of the car, and he grabs her again. So she swings the knife back toward him several times, just kind of blindly trying to get out. And she gets him. She stabs him a couple of times in the abdomen. He takes off running. She takes off running into her house. She closes and locks the door. She calls 911. When police arrived, she was still so afraid she wouldn't come out of the house. She was terrified that Ludwig was somewhere nearby. But it didn't take long for police to find him. He was found collapsed and bleeding nearby and taken to a hospital where he was pronounced dead. That's great. I think that's really great. I know. People that fight back and are able to escape. And that is what we know so far about the missing Natalie Holloway and the murder of Stephanie Flores. Yeah, it just seems like, I don't know, so many people in this are just awful people. And if Joran van der Sloot manages not to get himself stabbed to death in that godforsaken prison, then he is set to be released on June 10th, 2038, at which time I believe he's going to be extradited to the United States to face some extortion charges in Alabama. And hopefully he will never see freedom again. I think... If they did take her body far enough from the coast for it not to be washed ashore, so there's like sandbars, I guess, is what the deal is with Aruba. So if a body was dumped before reaching those sandbars and reefs and things, then it would just wash back up on shore. But if they went far enough out then we'll probably never know what really happened. And it makes me sad that you know, her family is never going to get closure. But Beth tried to get Americans to boycott Aruba, and I'm here to tell you, if you have the chance to go to Aruba, go. It is a beautiful island with wonderful people, and I honestly, I have nothing but good things to say about the island of Aruba. And honestly, even as a grizzled 42-year-old, it's really hard to imagine anything terrible happening when you're feeling that wind on your face and the sun, and it's just beautiful. But you just got to remember that there are terrible people everywhere, and be careful, you know? On a lighter note, tell me something good. Do you have anything to recommend to our listeners? Yes, if you haven't already watched it, go to Netflix and watch uh, DOA. I didn't watch it for a long time because it quite honestly just didn't sound like something I would enjoy. It seems like kind of sci-fi fantasy mix. But then, you know, one lazy Saturday, I started one episode and holy hell, this show is amazing. Oh, nice. I haven't watched it yet, but it is on my uh, my watch list. I just started reading Radium Girls by Kate Moore. My dad uh, had given it to me and it's something we might cover in the future. It's pretty fascinating and, and terrible. And on the murder front, I've just finished the Cold podcast, which was excellent. So... Thank you so much for joining us today for this story. And obviously, honestly, there is so much information on the Natalie Holloway case that this could have been a three-hour episode. But when it all came down to it in the end, it's just all lies. It's all lies. So hopefully we've presented you with the most important information. And if you did enjoy it, please do take a quick moment to leave a review on iTunes. We'd be so grateful. Please join our Facebook group. You can find us on Twitter at Fresh Hell Pod. As usually, we'll post photos, also this time photos Annie took there on Aruba. We're going to post it on Instagram. And thanks for listening. Yeah, thanks so much. And please remember, if you're going through hell, keep going. Bye. Bye. <laughs>